what is the most American car there's ever been? Not Mustangs, not Cobras, not anything like that. I'd argue it's the Corvette. Corvette has made its entire reputation not through just being a big, brash American V8, but by actually going racing. And here at the Peterson Museum, they have one single room with the whole history of Corvettes racing, starting right here with the very first Corvette that ever went racing. Now, when the first Corvette came out, it looked quite cool, but it only actually had 150 horsepower. So it didn't really go down particularly well. Nobody thought it was anything of interest, but Corvette had an idea. They thought that if you could showcase this car's performance through racing against things, they might change it. They didn't go racing themselves. Back at the beginning of American Motorsport, all of the brands had come together and decided they weren't gonna do it. It was banned between them. No one at GM or Ford was allowed to officially go racing. So they gave two of those to NASCAR, and while they weren't particularly good, it changed the perception of the brand enough that people started to think a bit more about it. And they then followed with this one. This car looks basically the same, but it has another 100 horsepower. Whereas the original one only had 150 and people didn't really think much of it, we're talking 250 horsepower here. This one was taken to Daytona and set a record for the flying mile. They literally used to just race a straight mile down the beach at Daytona, which is rock solid as fast as they could. So this thing was built for pure straight line speed with a classic V8 under the motor. Of course, car built for pure speed, no corners. What do they do next? They took it to the Sebring 12 hours. Imagine racing a car that's entirely built just to go in a straight line at Sebring, a bumpy place with lots and lots of corners. They finished ninth. It actually did really well. So well that a man called Briggs Cunningham, perhaps one of the most important people in the history of American motorsport, decided he wanted to introduce them to Europe. Briggs Cunningham was the man who really made American cars popular in France. He had been racing in France at the Le Mans 24 hours for a decade or so by the time he got involved with Corvette. He'd raced things such as the Cadillac Le Monstre. Those were his creations. And when he decided he wanted to take a Corvette with him, the people inside Corvette weren't allowed to help him, but they were allowed to help him. So Briggs Cunningham took three cars with him and won his class and returned again the next year, by which point the people of France had seen Corvettes for the first time and fall in love just like that. After that, the people inside Chevrolet decided that actually, you know what? Racing's really good. It really helps out the brand. So let's make something else. This is perhaps the most famous racing Corvette of them all. It's a Corvette Grand Sport. They were gonna build 125 of these machines with more power and a much lighter chassis. And then something went slightly wrong. Those big bosses at GM who were still banning them from racing, they found out and they canceled it. They'd only built three. Three of them existed, and they had at that point finally been sold to the privateers who were gonna buy them. One of them took this very car to the Nassau Speed Weeks in the Bahamas and won at such a canter that the Chevrolet executives who were there on holiday were a little bit embarrassed. Didn't change their minds though. You were still banned from racing Corvettes, but it changed something within the psyche of people racing privateer cars and more and more Corvettes began to be built for racing. So many and so well, but actually when they were racing in SCCA competition, they were a little bit too fast and they banned them. But in order to not mm, annoy Chevrolet too much, the SCCA created its own single make racing series just for C4 Corvettes. The one-way championship only lasted from 1988 to 1989, but never mind all the way back to 1953 through the 60s, 1988 was the first time GM had ever had an official involvement with motorsport with that one-way racing. But that didn't actually mean they were returning or even starting, because the next place we get is this. This is the Callaway Corvette. 
a Dutch man called Reeves Calloway created this because he wanted to go and race a Corvette, but there was no Corvette to race. So he bought a Corvette, gave it a custom body, uprated the engine with six and a half liters and raced it himself. This one qualified on pole its first year out, but didn't finish the race. Next year, three cars came back and they won their class, which clicked something within GM. They realized that actually maybe there was something to this racing luck because here we go, a yellow Corvette for the first time. This one was the C5 Corvette, the one that really began it all. Now we have a factory GM racing team racing Corvettes. This one raced at the Daytona 24 hours with Dale Earnhardt himself. It was the only time Dale Earnhardt ever raced a sports car at Daytona. He raced it alongside his son, Dale Earnhardt Jr. and they finished second. That went on to win its class in IMSA that season. But what it really began was what's in the rest of this room here. The C6R that followed it was when GT1 racing was at its height and Corvette was GT1 racing. The only car that was ever really able to get close to it was the screaming V12 Aston Martin DBR9. And the battles between these two at Le Mans became absolutely legendary. But unfortunately, GT1 was incredibly expensive. And by the end of its time, you really did only have Aston Martin and Chevrolet and sort of only Chevrolet. So the ACO stepped in and all the teams stepped down into GT2, which became called GTE. And thus we have the C6R. Now this one means quite a lot to me because the first time I ever went to the Le Mans 24 hours, I saw this car race. At this point, not only have the people of Le Mans fallen in love with Briggs Cunningham's blue and white Chevrolet Corvettes, they now have these yellow machines. They have taken them to their hearts and the sound of C6R Corvettes is something that you really could never forget. It won its class more than once and again dominated in IMSA, which left us with this, its follow-up, the C7R. One of the parts of perhaps the best history the Le Mans 24 Hours has ever seen when Aston Martin and Corvette went head to head right down to the last lap. Still with a big V8 under the bonnet, still rumbling away, but now a factory car that people could love. Now I would argue that there is nothing to a European more American than a Corvette. You can take your Mustangs and you can take your Cobras, but this, a front engine Corvette with a big V8 engine, that is American motoring to us Europeans. And there is no more big engined, big muscle Corvette than this one built by John Greenwood. The spirit of Le Mans Greenwood Corvette is one of the mightiest cars that may ever have raced. It could do 220 miles an hour down the Malzahn Strait. And that was because it had 975 horsepower. And why did it have 975 horsepower? Because under the bonnet, it's not a five liter V8. It's not a paltry six liter V8. It is a 9.8 liter V8. That is a lot of American firepower. Unfortunately, it really didn't do particularly well at Le Mans, but with great big wide arches and that massive V8, which if you ever hear one, sounds like nothing else you will ever hear. It must be the coolest Corvette there has ever been.